they act as though that that was just a massive giveaway. First of all, not taking a person's taxes, that's not giving them something. That would be like me not mugging you and saying, see, I gave you $10 by not mugging you and taking $10 from you. No, that's not how that works. That's their money, not your money. But it does sort of show the Democrats' hand and that really they believe that everybody's money is their money. And they're being gracious enough to let you have some of it. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. I didn't touch anything, I swear! Oh, Ty, what did you do? It wasn't my fault! And for today's edition of Breaking the Internet, we found yet another meme that is untrue. I know it's a shock. I know. I, I, I think I always thought that memes were always 100% correct and never contained anything wrong or misleading. But it turns out on the internet, there are some memes that are just not true. And so I saw this one and I had to do it just because I looked at it and immediately saw that literally everything it claimed, except for one thing, and we'll, we'll tell you what the surprise one thing that they claimed was true. Uh, actually was correct. But this is one that I saw the other day. It's from Occupy Democrats. We've done some of their stuff on breaking the internet before. So this was one that they came up with. So you'll see here. So far, Democrats have cut child poverty in half, added 5.3 million jobs, managed the most ambitious vaccine rollout in the nation's history, and passed a $1.2 trillion investment in the water, roads, bridges, and broadband. Trump gave two trillion to the rich and tweeted a lot. So obviously trying to draw a contrast between Democrats and Trump, which first of all, as Van Jones, who by the way is a self-proclaimed communist, so not exactly a person on the right, as he claimed this idea that Democrats can just run being not Trump, saying basically that the crux of their campaign is, well, I'm not Trump. He said that's dead now. After the off-year, off-year election that we had in Virginia and New Jersey and some of the outcomes of those elections, Van Jones even had to say, you know what, the idea that Democrats can just say, hey, I'm not Trump and get elected, that's gone. And the reason is because Democrats greatly overestimated the hatred of Trump. Not to say that it wasn't there, not to say that it wasn't a prevalent force, but they have thought that that can just sort of wield them to victory on its own and you know, when, the, when it came down to the wire and you had to look at the scoreboard, turns out, no, actually, you can't do that. That is not, in fact, a winning strategy on its own. But anyway, this meme claims a lot of things other than talking about Trump. It claims that Democrats have made all of these accomplishments. So let's go ahead and look at these claims. So, okay, so first of all, claim number one, they have cut child poverty in half. No, they haven't. That's really about the only rebuttal uh, that you need. Uh, because they don't do anything to back up their source. They, they don't say how they've cut it in half. But when you do dig into it and look at the numbers, I mean, it's just abundantly clear. They're just bringing this up out of thin air. But let's look at the child poverty rates right now. So this is from the, uh, you can actually look this data up. This is from the same department that does the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And they, they sort of analyze trends over the years. And you can, by the way, look at all my sources down there underneath the video. You can see them in the description. So this is a line graph of where the child poverty rate is, is a percentage of the total child population. So you'll see it mostly stays, it ventures a little bit below 15 occasionally. But you'll see that it mostly stays somewhere between about 23% and roughly... 15, 14%, something like that. You'll see it hit its, it, it actually hit its low in 1969 at 14%. And the reason that I chose these dates specifically, they'll go all the way from 1964 to 2020, because that's the most recent year that we have with the statistics being complete. So I don't even understand how they can make that claim considering 2021 is not over yet. And that is the first year that Joe Biden has been in office. So I don't really even understand how they're claiming this, because if you look back all the way to 1964, you'll see that that number jumps up and down quite a bit. It's always somewhere between 23 
and 14. It never ventures out of that. And so right now, the rate being about 16.1, which again is actually the number from President Trump because he was president in 2020. The numbers for 2021 haven't come out yet. For them to have cut it in half at any point in the past 60 years, it would have had to have been half of 23, which, you know, would be like um, 11 and a half. And so by no mathematical <laughs> explanation is 16.1 halving of that. And this is all the way going back to Lyndon Baines Johnson's great society and trying to destroy poverty. This was the, the year that the war on poverty started. And it started at 23%, and it's now at 16 And it was actually pretty close to 23% back in the Obama years. And I'm not necessarily blaming Obama for that. For that. I'm just saying that they act as though, well, you know, putting a, a Democrat in the White House, that just solved all the problems with child poverty. Except you can't say that you halved it, because at no point in that 60-year history has it ever been half of 23. And if you were going by the more recent numbers, that number would actually be lower, so it would be even harder to get to half. And so I don't understand how anyone could claim. I really, I, it seems like they just really just pulled that out of their butt. I, I have no idea where they're getting that statistic. But that's what they're saying, that somehow they cut poverty in half. But if you look back in the since the 60s, we really haven't done a whole lot or, or made any progress on that. And that's part of the problem. Democrats really believe that poverty can be eliminated and that it can be eliminated by government interference. But you just saw the chart. We've been doing this now for 60 years. And we've spent over $20 trillion on it, on the war on poverty, and poverty's still pretty much about the same. I mean, it's still in that same range that it's been since the 1960s. So I don't understand how they could claim they've cut child poverty in half. It is just a baffling claim. The second claim that they get to, the jobs have been recovered. Uh, remember, they claim that they have created 5.3 million jobs. Well, actually, those jobs have been recovered jobs, not created jobs. In other words, they were jobs that we had before the pandemic that have been an upswing from the pandemic. So that is true, technically. But they're kind of ignoring the fact they're saying they created them, not recovered them. And so that is very misleading. They, you can't, first of all, when Republican presidents do it, I said this when Trump said it, government doesn't create jobs. Government can transfer jobs. In other words, they can make jobs in the government and then make people that previously were private industry and, and move them into the public industry and government. But they can't create jobs. All they can do is shuffle things around. And so when Republican presidents say it, it's just as stupid as when Democrat presidents say it. Government doesn't create jobs. They simply don't do it. Now, you could say that Trump's economic policies and lack of red tape and restrictions led to more jobs in the country as a whole, and I think that that's perfectly feasible. But you can't say that government created jobs. So they claim that, which is already, I think, fallacious on its head. But even if you accept the fact that government could theoretically create jobs, the jobs that they have gained, the 5.3 million where the job numbers have increased, that's not them. That's a natural resurgence from the pandemic. We lost all these jobs, and now we're getting a little bit back. And the thing is, not only is that not created jobs, because I could kind of buy it if, say, uh, in Joe Biden's administration, we got back to pre-pandemic levels and then created 5.3 million jobs on top of that. Again, I still disagree with the wordage, the, the word choice used there in created, but I would have at least said, okay, you have to give them that one, 5.3 million jobs more than we had before the pandemic. But we're actually still in the hole. We're, we're not even just back to where we were before the pandemic. We're still lagging behind. And so it's an incredibly misleading way to try to portray this. Let's go ahead and look at, for example, the unemployment rate. So this is the unemployment rate going all the way back to 2001. You'll see there that there's a massive spike in the unemployment rate in that little gray area there right after uh, 2019, that's because that's 2020, that's when the pandemic hit. And you'll see that massive, massive spike, and then you'll see it start to somewhat gradually move down. But if you'll look, you'll notice that the civilian unemployment rate is still floating somewhere just under the six-point range, 
which is nowhere near the under four points that we had before the pandemic. And so them acting as though they've created all these jobs, I mean, it's just it's just incredibly misleading for them to try to portray it this way, considering the unemployment rate is still actually higher than it was before we had the pandemic. And by the way, it's not just limited to that. If you look at the labor participation rate, which I've always said is actually probably a little bit better statistic, it's by no means perfect because it doesn't really account for people that are like retired or children or that kind of thing. But if you look at the, the civilian labor participation rate, you'll see that it's not even two thirds recovered. It's about a third recovered at best. It's not even halfway. And so this idea that Joe Biden has come in and all of his policies just created all these jobs, there's no truth to it. We're not even back to where we were before the pandemic started, much less, you know, that being jobs that were created, that we're just bringing back things that were already dead and we're trying to get back to where we were. And so this idea that that was happening, no, that, that's a natural resurgence of jobs that would have happened regardless of who was in the White House. And frankly, based on the policies, probably would have happened a lot faster if Joe Biden had not implemented a lot of the policies that he had. And so there's no way to prove that we're dealing with a what if scenario there. But I genuinely believe that we would have had a much bigger and quicker resurgence if Joe Biden was not in the White House. So what this essentially amounts to is it would be like the mayor of a city right after, let's say New Orleans, for example, because that's one that gets hit hard by hurricanes every now and then. So let's say a big hurricane comes through, knocks out everything in New Orleans, and then people are selling a case of 24 waters for like $90 per case. Okay, well, that's a ridiculous price to pay for bottled water, but it's going for that because of scarcity in that city. Well, let's say two weeks later, when everything's died down and the case of water is back to its, its usual market price, and let's say it's you know, $10, $15, something like that, the mayor gets in front of everybody and like, look, guys, I brought down the price of water. No, you didn't, you moron. The price of water was going to go down anyway once everything started to recover from the hurricane. But that's what Joe Biden and the Democrats are trying to do here. They're trying to come out and be like, look, we created all these jobs. I mean, Joe Biden said in a speech yesterday that I'm a, I'm a job. This has been a jobs presidency. No serious person believes that. I mean, if you look at the job numbers and you just, I mean, look outside and look at all the help wanted ads, you can tell that that's nowhere near true. We're still significantly below the levels that we were even at the pandemic levels. Like I showed you with the labor participation rate, we're not even, but about a third recovered. So no, we're nowhere near where we need to be. And the growth that has happened has just been the springboard that would have happened no matter who was in the White House. But if that's the case, you know, maybe we should, we should do something that's a comparison that's more fair. Like, like I said, we can't really know, like if Donald Trump had won, for example, that the jobs would be significantly better, except there is a way to kind of know it. There is some comparison that we can kind of make, which is, why don't we compare red states and blue states and how they dealt with the pandemic? So which states have better job recovery and have done a better job overall on getting really closer to where they would have been pre-pandemic? So the way that we're going to do this is first, let's go ahead and look at the top 10 states with the most jobs lost from February 2020 to July 2021. So let's go ahead and bring that graphic up. So these are the ones that have the most jobs still missing and still lost. So you'll see number one, Hawaii, number two, Nevada, number three, Connecticut, number four, Vermont, number five, New Jersey, number six, Rhode Island, number seven, California, number eight, Maryland, number nine, New York, and number 10, Virginia. Wow. All blue states. Not a single red state in there anywhere. And you're looking at the percentages, and they do get lower, of course, as they go down because it's, it's done in, in numeric order. But this is adjusted for population. So Hawaii has the most. There's, they're, they're at a negative 9.3 from last year. So almost 10% of their jobs are still missing. And then Nevada, Connecticut, uh, Vermont, you're still even at the, the top 10, even with Virginia, you're still just barely floating under 5%. And so that's a lot of jobs missing in very, very blue states. And that is really a tragedy because 
what you're seeing there is they have those crazy pandemic policies that are still in place. A lot of the shutdowns lasted a lot longer. And because of that, a lot of those businesses went away. So those are some of those jobs that just aren't coming back. And so because they implemented Democrat policies and probably because they had some policies that were already anti-business already in place, their jobs simply didn't recover as quickly. So let's go ahead and by contrast, look at the states that have had the best job recovery. Number one, South Dakota. Number two, Oregon. Number three, Idaho. Number four, Wisconsin. Number five, Montana. Number six, Utah. Number, se uh, number seven, South Carolina. Number eight, Oklahoma. Number nine, Alaska. And number 10, North Dakota. Now you will notice here that there are two blue states in this list, Oregon and Wisconsin. But Wisconsin even though it's traditionally blue, it's kind of a swing state and always has been. Uh, it, it was blue for about a decade and a half reliably, but the Rust Belt is not like an ensconched, like New England or the West Coast, the deep, deep blue district with basically all Democrats have been running it for decades now. That's not really where Wisconsin was. It's really more of a purple state and it went pretty overwhelmingly for Trump in the election before this one, so back in the, the 2020 election, or sorry, not the 2020 election, the 2016 election. And then in the 2020 election, it did go for Biden, although there was some contention about that, that it did go for Biden, but it was close. And so when you look at those two things, you've got one very blue state, Oregon blue, there's no excuse for that one, but you look at the other states, really eight out of 10 of the top 10 on the best job recovery, all of them very red states. And then you have one kind of purplish state that goes back and forth. And then you have Oregon, which is admittedly a blue state. But I mean, eight out of 10, that's a pretty strong number. 80% of the top 10, in other words, have been states that implemented Republican policies. And so there's no question when you're looking at these two that the Republican states and the ones that didn't you know go full in for year-long lockdowns and that kind of thing are doing way better on the job recovery rate. Then another thing I want you to look at this chart one more time, you'll notice the percentage there. When it talks about jobs recovered, you'll notice that some of them are in the positive. What does that mean? Actually, all of them are in the positive. It means that not only did they get to pre-pandemic levels, they actually gained jobs. They have more jobs than they did before. South Dakota, 4.6. I don't know how that happened. I mean, that's that's astounding. And you'll remember they're also the state that didn't shut down at all. Never had a shutdown, never had a mask mandate. And they're at 4.6% recovery. I mean, that's better than Alabama, Texas, or Florida, who all had those things in some measure. And then you've got other Republican states like the Mountain West, Idaho, Wisconsin, which I said, purple state, Montana, very red, Utah, very red. South Carolina, very red, and in the deep south, um, or it, at the very least the south. I don't know if they, it depends on who you ask whether or not that's the deep south. Uh, Oklahoma, another red state, Alaska, North Dakota. These are all very red states that have had a much better go with the pandemic. And so really, I mean, if you're looking at red states versus blue states, there's no comparison there. And so, you know, Democrats claiming that they added 5.3 million jobs no, you didn't. And in fact, a lot of the jobs that you quote unquote added took place in red states where your policies were not enacted. And so it's funny that they're actually partially hanging that hat on a, uh, the, a largely red state accomplishment there. It's, it's really funny to watch that. Um, but, you know, essentially claiming that they have added 5.3 million jobs when we still have 5.1 million jobs that are still missing, that we're still 5.1 million in the hole. And they're like, look at all these jobs we've created. I'm sorry. It's just laughable. There's no truth to it whatsoever. So let's go ahead and look at claim number three, the vaccine rollout uh, that they have overseen and managed the most ambitious vaccine rollout that there has ever been. Okay, well, they have managed the vaccine rollout, and the numbers really haven't been bad. In fact, I think that they've been, compared to other vaccine rollouts in history, it's been one of the more successful ones. That is correct. But one of the things that they're kind of ignoring is that the Trump administration 
is the one that oversaw the vaccine actually being produced. And they already had a lot of the mechanisms for distribution already in place when Joe Biden took office. And you don't have to take my word for it. And again, you might have problems with the vaccine. You may not have even think the vaccine being rolled out is a good thing. That's not what we're talking about right now. We're specifically talking about the claim in this meme that the Democrats are responsible for the rollout and they managed it and oversaw it and that you should give them a pat on the back for that. And I'm not saying that they haven't managed it fine, but what I am saying is they act as though this is some big accomplishment when really the groundwork was already laid with President Trump. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can listen to the, the great saint of the COVID stan religion, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Is the Biden administration starting from scratch with the vaccine distribution effort, or are you picking up where the Trump administration left off? No, I mean, um, we certainly are not starting from scratch because there is activity going on in the distribution. President Biden said that what was left was abysmal, essentially. I mean, is there anything actionable that you are taking from the previous administration? Well, is that delaying your efforts to get the vaccine? I mean, that's the question. No, I mean, we're, we're, we're coming in with fresh ideas, but also some ideas that were not bad ideas with the, with the, with the previous administration. You can't say it was absolutely not usable at all. So we are continuing, but you're going to see a real ramping up. of. All right. So that's Dr. Anthony Fauci again saying, well, actually, a lot of this stuff was already in place with the Trump administration. We're going to be ramping it up. There's some new ideas that we're going to utilize. But ultimately, the plan was already in place. We're not starting from scratch. You can't say that it was unusable or that there aren't things that we're going to be continuing. And when she says, well, is it delaying you at all? And he says, no, it's not delaying us at all. Is it delaying you in any way? No. And so they act as though Trump had absolutely no plans for distribution. There was nothing there. And then Joe Biden came in, fixed it all, managed it all, and then brought it out. That's simply not true. And in fact, when Joe Biden took the oath of office and became president, we already had about a million shots already distributed by that point. You can look at this graphic that looks over the vaccine rollout, and you'll see there that it goes from January to March. You'll see that on January 20th, which is the day that President Biden was inaugurated, there was already well over a million shots that had been issued. And they were, I mean, it's just astounding that they're trying to take credit on two counts now for things that were largely Republican accomplishments. Now, again, you might have a problem with the vaccine. You might think that the vaccine doesn't work or isn't nearly as effective as they should be or it has some risk. By the way, I share those concerns, but that's not what we're dealing with right now. We're specifically dealing with Democrats taking credit for something that was largely started by and run by Republicans, and all that groundwork was already put into place. And so basically all they had to do was not drop the ball and screw it up, and they could get credit for something that really they had nothing to do with. And the next claim, I think, might be one of my favorites. Um... They claimed that they invested $1.2 trillion in roads. Of course, this is a reference to the stimulus package or the uh, infrastructure package. And I use infrastructure loosely, and I'm going to explain why in a second. And they say specifically, because you look back at the graphic, they don't just say infrastructure. They specifically say, you can look at it, $1.2 trillion investment in the water, roads, bridges, and broadband. So that's not just the big sweeping thing of infrastructure, which the Democrats have now deemed basically everything. Bernie Sanders even said like paid maternity leave and paternity leave. That's infrastructure. No, it's not. You old, retired, sad commie. It, no, nobody defines infrastructure that way. You're just saying that because you want to be able to call the bill infrastructure because infrastructure is a word that pulls very well with the average person and you don't want them to catch on what you're actually doing, which is just sort of a watered down version of the Green New Deal. So that's what actually was in this package. But they're claiming specifically, not even just saying infrastructure, so they can't hide behind that. They're saying it was specifically water, roads, bridges, broadband. Not true. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can look at, for example, uh, this from Fortune. If I can go ahead and bring it up. There we go. Uh, if you look at this article from Fortune, infrastructure, as many people think of it, Construction, improvement of bridges, highways, roads, ports, waterways, and airports accounts for only $157 billion, or 7% of the plan's estimated cost. 
That's apparently what Voigt was referring to. The definition of infrastructure can be reasonably expanded to include upgrading wastewater and drinking water systems, expanding high-speed broadband internet service to 100% of the nation, modernizing the electric grid, and improving the infrastructure resilience. That brings the total to $518 billion, or 24% of the plan's total cost. So even by the most generous, widest, broadest definition of the word infrastructure, and granted, this would also have included the broadband portion, which they did include in their meme, even by doing all of that, it would only be a little less than a quarter of the bill's total cost. And so the idea that they invested $1.2 trillion in, in bridges and broadband and waterways and roads, no, that's not true. Not even close to true. At best, it would have been a quarter of that amount. It would have been, you know, somewhere in the, the, the 300 million range, which is still a ridiculous amount. But the point is they're lying about the 1.2 trillion. They spent about 300 million, or sorry, um, what was it? 5.8, uh, 518 million, 518 million on those things, which accounted to about 24%. And then they spent the rest on their cronies and payoffs for people in political positions and to, to say that they're doing things, port barrel, spill, port barrel spending to try to get the bill through. No, you only spent about 24% of that total cost on actual roads and bridges and infrastructure, that kind of thing. Now, granted, because you, you might be sitting there scratching your head going, well, where's the math in that? What happened is they actually scaled back the price a little bit, but they did it through accounting measures. And so that 1.2 trillion, uh, it would have been slightly less, but it still would have been roughly 24% of it. It wouldn't have been fi uh, 518 because that was an older version of the bill. But when they scaled it back, eventually they're going to be spending about 4 trillion. That, that's going to be the real cost of it. But if you scaled it back, it would have been less than, than 518 million, but it still would have been around 24% of the bill's overall cost. And so either way, even by using the broadest and, and most generous definition of the word infrastructure, the idea that you spent specifically on roads, bridges, broadbands, and waterways, 1.2 trillion is simply not true. Uh, most of this stuff, unfortunately, is things that the government never had any reason to get involved in anyway. For example, there's no reason for the federal government to get involved in everybody having broadband. Internet companies, because they are competitive and because they want to have that infrastructure in place, they were building that themselves. You could have done that without a dollar of taxpayer money. Now, it might have taken a little bit longer, but it would have not added to our debt and we would have gotten it for free. Now, you ask the average person, uh, do you want this new car for free if you wait a couple of years for it? Or would you rather pay the full amount, actually a little bit more than market value right now and have it? Well, a smart person would say, you know what? I'm just going to wait and get it for free. But the government's like, oh, no, well, it's not our money anyway, so let's just go ahead and get it now. That's stupid. All of those things would have eventually happened regardless of whether the, the regardless of re whether or not the government got involved in it. And this is something that affects Alabama more than most places, my home state. Because there's a lot of people out there in rural places that have to get some kind of satellite internet or some kind of workaround for broadband. And I, and I hate that for them. But that's part of the cost of living in a rural area. And I say this as a guy from Marbury, not exactly a thriving metropolis. And there were times where we didn't have internet because of that. And you know what? That was fine because that was part of the trade-off of getting to live out in the country. I didn't wait for, I wasn't like praying for the government to spend trillions of dollars of other people's money just so I could have faster internet. That's stupid. But the, the government apparently feels like this is their responsibility for some reason. Anyway, let's go ahead and go to the next claim. They also claimed that Trump spent $2 trillion and gave it to rich people. Now, for those of you who don't speak idiot, what they're trying to convey here is that in the tax plan that he put forward, which by the way, wasn't just Trump's plan, it was also passed by Congress. I know that this is hard for them to comprehend that you could actually get a law through without an executive order that would be passed through Congress. Uh, but, but, but it was actually passed through Congress. And the tax cut did result in about $2 trillion of tax revenue, not, or not tax revenue out being brought in, but uh, a $2 trillion cut for the wealthiest of Americans. That is correct. That's what this is actually a reference to. However, 
they act as though that that was just a massive giveaway. First of all, not taking a person's taxes, that's not giving them something. That would be like me not mugging you and saying, see, I gave you $10 by not mugging you and taking $10 from you. No, that's not how that works. That's their money, not your money. But it does sort of show the Democrats' hand and that really they believe that everybody's money is their money. And they're being gracious enough to let you have some of it. But Trump shouldn't have been gracious enough to let them keep a little bit more of their money. But the thing is, this was not something that was just a giveaway to the rich people. Most people, most Americans, actually did get a tax cut. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the New York Times, not exactly a right-wing conservative rag. So this is the New York Times from a couple years ago in, in 2017. Face it, you probably got a tax cut. The Tax Policy Center estimates that 65% of people paid less under the law and just 6% paid more. And in parentheses, the rest saw little changes to their taxes. So in other words, 94% of people either saw no change in their taxes at all, and then 65 of that percentage actually paid less under the law. So the idea that this is just a, a big giveaway to the 1%, no, it wasn't. There's 64 or more percent <laughs> that, that you have to include in all of that. And uh, claiming this is just absurd. The idea that giving, that not taking taxes from somebody is giving them money, that's simply not true. And by the way, of the six people that saw their taxes increase, it actually was only because one of the things that was included in that bill is they changed the way that they calculated state income tax. So the way that it was calculated before this bill went through is that it took your state income tax off the top and taxed you at whatever income was left over after your state income tax. This law did away with that. So the people that were actually paying more in taxes it was mostly people in blue states that have very high income tax rates. And so their taxes could have gone down if their state wasn't stupid. What was happening beforehand is the federal government was essentially subsidizing the tax burden of people living in blue states by taxing them less based on that. It was unfair. And so now what they're doing under the new Trump tax plan was actually fair. Unfortunately, with this new stimulus package that they put through, what they did was they actually put that back in place. And so, you know, you want to talk about Trump giving, again, I disagree with that verbiage, but if you're going to talk about Trump, you know, giving things away in terms of not making them pay more tax taxes, what this bill did with the way that they reverted it back to the way that they calculate it after state income tax, that was just basically a payoff to people living in blue states. And they're subsidizing the idiotic tax policies of people living in blue states by giving them a quote unquote tax break. And so the Democrats can talk about that all they want, but that largely benefited wealthy people in blue states. Anyway, more importantly than all of this though, is that it does sort of illustrate that Democrats really see everybody's money as their money and they're just letting you keep a portion of it. They don't see it as something that you actually earned and belongs to you. Uh, for example, there was a winners and losers list on this two one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill. There was a winners and losers list that Bloomberg put together, and these were the ones that they said won. In other words, they benefited from the one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Amazon, FedEx, UPS, every major airline, so American, Delta, Southwest, Northwest, all of that. So all the major airlines, steel producers, internet service providers, internet companies, so that would be ISPs, which would be like AT&T, Xfinity, Comcast, all of those companies, Charter, that kind of thing. And then also the internet companies themselves. So your Googles, your Facebooks, your, like they already said, Amazon, all of those big internet companies, they were the winners in this. And also nuclear energy, CVS, Signacorp, and United Health Group. So some of the biggest insurance and pharmacy providers in the world. That's an awful lot of big businesses for people that are supposedly just helping out the little guy. Somehow they benefited from the $1.2 trillion that were given. Now, some of these benefited indirectly. For example, 
uh, we were talking about broadband, they would have been, um, you know, that would have been put in place by the companies themselves. Well, now they just don't have to pay for it. And so it's not like the government is giving, for example, Charter or Comcast money to provide people internet, but now they're building infrastructure that those companies would have had to build beforehand. And now they're just getting it for free. So it's not indirect payments, but they're directly benefiting from the things that are in the bill. And so you'll notice there, a whole lot of big companies, a lot of Fortune 500 companies are directly benefiting from the Democrats' policy. And in the losers category that Bloomberg put together, they said cryptocurrencies and environmental polluters, which is true. And then they also said that electric car companies and green energy providers, so solar panel companies, that kind of thing, they were the losers, but their, their rationale was pretty funny. They were only the losers because they got less money than they were expecting to. In other words, they were expecting the, the Green New Deal to just have piles of money delivered to them, and they were the losers because they got smaller piles of money delivered to them. They're still directly benefiting, but not as much as they thought they were going to. And so somehow in Bloomberg's mind, getting giant piles of money from the government, that's losing because you didn't get as much as you were originally anticipating. <laughs> I don't know how that wound up in the losers column, but that's how they, they calculated it. So the one thing that they did say was true. Trump did tweet a lot. That is accurate. He tweeted many, many things. He tweeted some smart things. He tweeted, I would say, mostly dumb things, uh, some things that were of no consequence, some things that created whole news cycles, even though they really shouldn't have. But that is the one thing in this meme that I can say unequivocally, not misleading, not in any way untruthful. Trump did tweet an awful lot. So props to Occupy Democrats for at least including one true thing in this whole meme. Here's the thing that you should think about, though, because we just went through systematically five of the claims made in this very short little synopsis of all the accomplishments Democrats have done since President Biden took office. They had to lie about all of them to make them look good. The fact that they had to lie to get and, and about all of them, there wasn't even one thing in there that you could go, OK, well, give them that one. They had to lie about every single one. Which indicates that they know that the presidency has been a disaster. They won't admit to it. And with the 1.2 trillion, they may even like the fact that it's going to a lot of, of big leftist donors and that kind of thing, but they have to sweep that under the rug and lie about that as well. And so they either know that the average American is not going to see that as an accomplishment, or they know it's not an accomplishment and have to lie about it completely. That's really should tell you all you need to know about the Democrat agenda. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. <laughs> 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 <laughs>